Michelle, and this is my so-called handmade life. I have a blog by the same name, and that is my name on Instagram. On Ravelry, I am Mamatronic, and there is a group for my so-called handmade life on Ravelry, where I have episode threads and then other threads, but we talk about things discussed in the episode. You can chat with each other or answer questions that I ask there or in the YouTube comments or on my blog, where I embed episodes. <clears throat> And just be aware, whatever you have to say, I might be talking about it in the next week because I really do appreciate your input and you help um, shape where our conversation goes from one week to the next. So I really can't do it without you and it's really not fun without you. So uh, I hope you all had as good a celebration of Mother's Day or mothers in your life, mother figures, uh, those who maybe passed those who are still with you, I hope it was as good a celebration as you could have, given everything that's going on in the world right now. Uh, it was okay for me. I didn't get to see uh, my daughter anytime around Mother's Day, which was kind of a bummer. We usually get together and kind of make it kind of for Mother's Day at some point. Um, so that was kind of sad. I mean, not sad, but it was a little bit of a letdown, but it can't be helped right now. I'm glad she's doing well. And we do talk a lot on FaceTime, or we have FaceTimed and watched movies together, which I don't know if I told you last week. We, uh, we tried Scener, watching a movie together via Scener, and the, the, the sound coming from their, you know, the phone, Messed, it was just, there was a time delay and it was just really maddening. So that didn't work so well. So last week we used um, just FaceTime and we set my iPad up below the TV on the, you know, little wardrobe and um, we just pressed start at the same time on a movie on Netflix. So that worked really well. We could kind of line up the, uh, you know, the timestamp on the video. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing that, plus we can see each other's reactions. And there's like, I mean, I was under the impression this movie was a little more G than it was. So there's this one character all of a sudden saying all this stuff and it's all this language. And I don't just love that, you know, I don't like that. I've tolerated it quite a bit, but I just was like, man, and I'm looking at my husband thinking, where is this about to go? I thought this show was like PG-13, what are you, you know? And I look, I'm looking at the screen and I look down at my iPad and I see my daughter and son-in-law are dying laughing, watching my reaction. It's like, that was better than the movie, you know? She's like, I knew you'd be reacting to that. Uh, it was kind of funny. The moment passed, it was all right. I can't even think of the name of the show now. Oh, it was kind of sci-fi like. Um, this is crazy, I'll just add it. I'll just add it to the bottom of the screen. It's been two weeks, I guess, since we did it. But, uh, so I do get to talk to her a lot. So it wasn't the end of the world that I didn't see her at Mother's Day. I did get to see my son. He's captive in our house right now. And uh, he gave me the sweetest card. We did a lot of uh, just chill and hang out this weekend stuff. Um, my husband took the weekend off and we went on a long walk. And then last weekend, I uh, kind of spiffed up my bicycle. I have a, a couple of vintage bikes that I found that needed work, and I did work on them a few years ago, and I blogged about it. I didn't know anything about how to do that, so when I did that so many years ago, it was a really good experience for me and becoming confident in something I didn't know how to do, and one of the big uh, motivators was Lovely Bicycle. It was a blog, and the author would take vintage bikes often and, uh, you know, fix them up. And she would have a link of resources and, and actually had a tag um, or a tab on the, the site that talked about budget options. If you wanted a loop, especially loop frame bikes, she had a lot of step through bikes, um, but she had budget options. And I, uh, that really motivated me. And eventually I found a Raleigh DL1 on Craigslist in Houston. So we drove to get it and I did all the work myself or did it with my husband's help. If it was something that required a little more strength than I had, it was a good experience. So anyway, I cleaned up the bike because 
the hurricanes and the moisture of the last few years have sort of made like a little veneer of rust here and there. And so I, I cleaned up the bike. We got new inner tubes and yesterday, or yeah, we took it for a ride and that was nice to go on a long ride. Drove to my sister's house. We rode to my sister's house, visited. So it was a nice little Mother's Day something. We social distance visit. So I sit on one end of her porch. She sits on the other. And uh, But it's still nice. Um, okay, so my whole point in mentioning that, besides that it was a good weekend, the author of Lovely Bicycle, which that uh, blog kind of ended in 20, I don't know, 15 maybe, is also the designer behind LB Hand Knits. LB for Lovely Bicycle. I did not get that. I didn't real put the two together. In fact, I think I mentioned LB Hand Knits for um, one of the places to get free patterns a few episodes ago when the quarantine started and she was doing a quarantine along and I believe she offered a code for a discounted pattern or maybe free. And if you completed it, you could get another if it's within that period. And I believe it goes to the end of June. So you actually have time to participate in that knit along. Um, I didn't think I would be participating and I know I won't finish anything in that time period. However, um, she has come up with another knit along in conjunction with Carolyn of Newton and Yarns for her Fisherman's Muse sweater, which I love that sweater. Um, and let me find it. Um, I'm gonna just show you a few of LB Hand Knits uh, patterns that I really like. Um, and the names, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing them right. And I probably should have done a, a Google search on how to pronounce, but I haven't because I just really want a podcast. So Splidor, I believe is the name, but I'm going to have it on the bottom of the screen and all the links to it in the notes. So you will be able to find it, even if I cannot pronounce it. This is Nilka. There's some lace work, but it's all spaced out really beautifully. And you can see there's this color changing yarn that's used, a, a variegated and it works it, because it's not too much texture mixed with color here. I don't know that people care that much about that anymore because I just feel like color and texture and just splash it everywhere, we're all kind of into that. Here's another, um, it's crescent shaped. So I just think that's really beautiful um, and really classic looking. <clears throat> okay, this yoke, oh, and I'm just guessing on pronunciations, Moynier. Just look at this yoke. So, you know, yoke sweaters are kind of the thing right now. This one's a little different. I really, really love it. I think a lot of these patterns also are worsted weight. Yeah, this is Aran weight yarn, so I think a worsted would work. Most of us have some kind of worsted weight stash we could use for this. Okay, Song and Dance makes me think a little of that sweater that I modified to have a stripe of kind of a, um, a Nordic snowflake going across it. That's what this makes me think of, but it is a great um, mixture of color and color work. Isn't it beautiful? That one's Song and Dance and this, I'm going to show you my very favorite here. Latus. And I may be saying it wrong. This is an all over cable pattern that to me is just so classic. It's so beautiful. Gonna, gonna make that. <clears throat> all right, so. The next one that she has is Fisherman's Muse. Um, it's not the next one, it's not the newest, but whereas she had that quarantine along going, and it's going to the end of June. Um, I think I told you about it two episodes back, and I may have just said this, <clears throat> but I took another take, so I'm not sure. Um, she did offer discounted patterns. Uh, if you join in, a discounted pattern, and then if you finish that pattern, you can get another at a discount. She'll offer another coupon code. This is an asymmetrical hem with a little bit of lace work at the hem and a kind of a funnel neck. 
So it's a bulky weight pattern that would knit up pretty quick and it's not too late to join this knit along. She's doing it in conjunction with Carolyn of Newtoden Yarns. So, you know, you're encouraged to use Newtoden and you get a discount if you are um, <clears throat> a subscriber to Carolyn's Patreon, which I am. Um, Honor Ulker, I think is how you say her um, podcast. And her yarn is special. It's like a pre-spun. And uh, you would hold like three strands together to make this. So let me show you Carolyn's version of the sweater. You can see the asymmetrical hem really well. This to me, with that neck, that look, this looks like a really great outdoors type uh, sweater. That is Carolyn's version in her Newtoden yarn of the Fisherman's Muse. So I really want to do this. I'd like to do it for the knit along. We'll see if I get it together in time. But um, I do have some Newtoden yarn. So that would be um, that would be a lot of fun to do. Anyway, I thought it was cool. I, I just realized that Albina of LB Hand Knits is Love with Icicle. And that was back in the day when I read blogs all the time. I loved my blog. I loved writing in it. I was always surprised when anyone read it. And I miss it. I miss it so much. I miss reading blogs, which they're still there. They're still out there. A lot of them have been discontinued or just not updated. But there are still lots of people regularly blogging. And a lot of you actually are regularly blogging. I'm thinking of Regina. Um, so that's encouraging. But uh, I miss that time. It is quick and easy to do Instagram updates on things, but I feel like a little something is lacking because you really can't write like you would with a blog and you can't maybe explore with images or with your thoughts quite the same way. So, all right, so what am I wearing? Do we all see it here? Oh, it's fallen down. It's a mess on me. This is my color craze by Tammy Gore. Um, I'm wearing it. I probably upside down, but I like it this way. I like the colors appearing this way. So uh, I knit this quite a while back. It's been finished for a while. Um, I just, you know, didn't get my photos for a long time. And we went on a camping trip a while back before we were in lockdown and uh, I snapped some pics then. So, oh my goodness, I love this. Let me get to where you can kind of see. So this is how I'm wearing it. It's probably actually upside down. I think the, the pattern, one of you told me for sure, it's meant, it's a bit uh, triangle-like or a slight crescent type shape here. But I actually like wearing it. I just take the top and I tuck it like this and I like wearing it as a crescent rather than a triangle. But you can see here, these colors, you know, here's the thing. Tammy has like so many really great, great shawl or wrap patterns. And I own many and I love them. But when I would collect them at my Ravelry library, I kind of have been on a sweater knitting kick. And so I wasn't knitting them. And so when I saw um, Molly of a homespun house, how she used her one of her mini skein sets to make it I thought okay I can do that but right now because I had one of her mini skein sets it was the rustic uh, mini skeins so these are kind of a subdued natural colors there is a background that is hawthorn silver tint which is a really nice almost a purpley gray it is kind of a purpley gray so it's hawthorn and then I used Molly's Rustic Minis, and I thought they all were very natural colors and they looked good together. And I talked about it a bunch when I was knitting it, how it looked like uh, layers of rock. Well, um, both sides look great on it. I'll just fill you in on it again because I never did a proper finished post on it. What Molly did, what I found is that I didn't have mini skeins that fit the amount in the grams that Tammy used in her sample for this. But I don't know why I felt that I had to rigidly stick with that. What Molly of a homespun house did was she would just 
use her mini skein set. She would start with, and it wasn't this set, it was another one. She would just start, and anytime it called for the contrast color, whichever color it called for, it didn't matter. She just used her mini until it was used up, and then she went to the next mini. And so, you know, halfway through a section for contrast color, it may change, and that's fine. Then she tied in the next one and used it. And I believe I did make a mini uh, magic uh, cake out of my mini skeins. So I really enjoyed it. And it took all the guesswork, everything out of it. I didn't worry about yardage amounts and grams. And it was just a pleasant experience all the way through. It has a little bit of brioche, just enough. Then it's got quite a bit of garter. Color changes keep it interesting. And there's even a little bit of lace you can see probably you can see the little lace pattern here and there. I'm not sure how well it shows up here. Let's see. Anyway, it's just uh, very special. I love it. I wore it this winter, though we didn't have much of a winter. But like I said, I, I really like almost wearing it scarf-like vest. And I love all these stripes. I'm pretty keen on stripes. So it was just a pleasant knit. I enjoy Tammy's pattern so much. I like her presence uh, on Instagram. And I like her business name, Narrow Path Designs. We share the same faith. And the Narrow Path is a reference to following Christ. And I like that she's so upfront about her faith that way. Um, I'm just looking through her patterns to show you some of my favorites. I like them all. Um, Kalia is one, I don't think I bought this, um, it is a rectangular wrap shape, which really works for how I like to wear shawls and things, and it would work really well with uh, stash or mini skeins with the striping, so I really like that. You've got quite a bit of texture. I see lace, I see mosaic knitting, I see garter. And I believe those darker blue stripes are a change in um, yarn. I think it's mohair. Yeah, mohair lace. She's using Huloco. So that is a really good way to use mohair. And I do have some mohair skeins here and there. Uh, definitely enough to be used for that contrasting stripe here and there in that uh, pattern. So that's going to happen one of these days. Another favorite and I've talked about this one before, is Milu. Tassels, color work, striping, she's got it all. That's a favorite. And I have in my head I, what I would use for it. I have some Madeline Tosh uh, skeins I got on sale, I think on the site here and there. And uh, I could put them all together. I think it would look really nice, some blue and some orange. Another one I like is Minis and Me, which is a great use of mini skeins. And I was hesitant to knit it for a while because I thought, well, I don't have minis that are the right grams and amount. If I didn't bother with this, I wouldn't bother on this one either. I would just have fun and switch my colors whenever. Isn't that pretty? And that's got a nice long shape, a little bit of an asymmetrical shape. So she's got so many patterns. I could just go on and on. I've talked about Ravenhill before on here for you guys. And there was one, oh yes, Adira. This always makes me think of a blanket that I had from Mexico. I think it's just her color choice, but I, I feel like you could really get, um, you could imitate a textile that you like with this, with the textures going on and the color changes. So. Anyway, I hope that's showing up. So, anyway, she's just a great designer. And I had to gush a little about it. And here's one. This sounds like her. Sweet Soul. I think she's a sweet soul. You've got texture, lace, and lots of fringe, plus some striping. It's like she knows all my favorite things. She really does have everything knitters like, all put together in one pattern and then she does it a little differently in the next one but it's got several elements ashbrook is the last one i'm going to show you i may cut some of these out because you know 
I like all the texture going on here. I also like her color choices. These are very neutral colors as compared to the relative whites of the others. So, all right, I'm done. I'm done showing you all the ones. So like I was saying, I like the name of her business, Narrow Path. It may have negative connotations to some people. Um, the idea of walking a narrow path sounds a little more dangerous or maybe a little more um, focused, like there's no room for error. <clears throat> maybe you have to give up things, right? It's not an easy wide way. You've got to give up some stuff to fit, to make yourself fit through this path. Um, it's more difficult. And sometimes that's true in following Christ, but there is a path to follow. And I do like that about it. Also, I think about the hiking that I've done and when you get off of the big main trails, oh, and especially paved or graveled trails, and you get to the path where the most beautiful and the most wonderful things are, I'm thinking of Yosemite, I'm thinking of the Appalachian Trail, it's very narrow. In fact, at one point, there's a drop off on one side, a drop off on the other, but we've got a solid path. It's narrow, but it's big enough. And we're walking on the Appalachian Trail. And that's the thoughts that her business name bring to mind. In faith, it's not so much about giving stuff up and not getting things as um, there's a lot of wonder waiting when you let those things just go. You just drop them off of you. You quit carrying them. Uh, there's a humility to it, to finding everything that you will find on the narrow path. So anyway, that's my tangent. <clears throat> All right. So on these quarantine movie nights, with that movie that I can't remember because it was so good, um, I knit the rest of my, the other, uh, it's a smooth operator pattern, but it was the Wood Pigeon colorway from Opal Yarns, right? Oh, I'm the worst. I have to look down for everything. West Yorkshire Spinners, not Opal, sorry. You know how West Yorkshire Spinners has these bird colorways? And Pheasant is one I've seen a lot, Christmas Robin. I really liked these colors in Wood Pigeon. And they kind of look like colors I've been knitting with the last few years quite a bit. So there's that denim type color, faded denim and purples. I really like the way these worked out. And I gotta tell you, um, I just reached for something already caked up to have a last minute cast on for that movie. So basically two movies and these socks were done. I used Hawthorne, um, the, it was pearlescent. It was the colorway from Knit Picks, and it really matches well with the gray, the off-white, I mean, that's in this sock. I mean, it matches perfectly. And because I didn't do a super high cuff, this is really the most wearable, uncomfortable length of cuff for me. I just have trouble stopping. I told you that with my Kia socks. It's really hard for me to stop because I like a color. But I made myself stop so that I have plenty of this left. I can knit another pair for my daughter at some point. Maybe that'll be with her Christmas gift. So these uh, were a fun knit. And it's an afterthought heel. I did it the Susan B. Anderson way. She does have directions, I believe, for a no waste yarn afterthought heel that she added to an update of the pattern. I don't think I've downloaded that update. I just haven't bothered. I, I knew this already and so I just do it without thinking when I'm watching a show, but I still have to try that Kirby Werby method. So maybe the next podcast I'll finally have tried it. So that was a fun uh, little project and it went easy. I got that yarn from Willy Thistle. You can find a lot of uh, European yarns and uh, she's doing a knit along and one of you told me about it. Was it Amanda? You just told me she's doing a 52 weeks of socks knit along, which I really like to do. Now, I don't know if you need to use her yarn for it because I wouldn't use West York, that West Yorkshire Spinners for one of those patterns in that book. I have some sock yarn. <laughs> I really don't need to get more, but she has really great John Arbin sock yarns and um, Jameson and Smith yarns and things. So she's got a lot of those at Rama 
yarns that I always hear about but never actually see in a shop. And if you don't have to have the yarn, I will put it on the bottom here. If you don't, if you just knit something from the book, I'll let you know. Because then I would be able to join in and maybe you would too. I like to have a sock going at all times. So, I mean, we've talked some about how you guys are handling quarantine. Uh, are you watching too much TV? A lot of you were watching too much news and probably now we're getting so used to the state of things we aren't as much or we're just so disgusted. We're having to take a break from so many things beyond the virus happening in the world. So this book was brought to my attention again recently, Doomsday Knits. I got this back when it came out. Um, Alex Tinsley put this together. It's a collection of fun knitwear designs. I mean, they're all very wearable, but a little reminiscent of a kind of steampunk or um, apocalyptic literature and television. So this one being the, <laughs> the most appropriate uh, knit for right now, I guess. Um, I'm just going to run through a few. Because we've been talking about summer things, summer tops and things, this one, Fatigued, I uh, totally, it's a, a dress. It could be a dress or a tunic. Very workable. With or without the pockets, if you don't want the pockets right there, you could move them or just not have them. I probably wouldn't have pockets. Most likely. I would on the side, like right here. The side pocket, just maybe not the top. Kind of a hooded shrug. Thinic. I like this tunic a lot. Ditch the tech. I like that U neck with the collar. This one's by Jeanette Cross. And Bulletproof was interesting. It had um, zippered, zipper off um, straps, which was kind of a, you know, kind of a edgy element to add to it. Oryx. I like Oryx for the little tab, button tab uh, straps. Okay, so that's just a fun book that I wanted to show. A lot of fun. It was fun to watch her put this together and she talked about a lot of the things like the photo shoots where she found these images of kind of rusted out buildings. I like themed books like that. You know, a lot of people have like Jane Austen knitwear or Harry Potter themed. This is one of the themed books I have. This one and um, uh, Great Northern Knits, which is based on Twin Peaks. Those are really fun themed books. So, you know, I've asked you guys how you're doing and some of you answered last week. I had some more answers this week. Um, Regina's really been enjoying. And I also asked you if you were feeling like pressure to somehow accomplish things because you had this extra time while you're in lockdown, which is a bizarre thing that we would even have happening when so many people are hungry and don't have jobs. That those of us who do or aren't hungry now are obsessively worrying that we're not making the most of our time. I'm not obsessively worrying about this, but it's out there. It, it's happening. Regina said she is enjoying being able to just be home and do what she wants, that she's worked for a long time and it was time and she's enjoying this. So it was good to hear that you're reveling in this and seeing it in a positive light. Susie says it's a little different with her spouse home. Like the time she would spend knitting or watching a podcast, she kind of almost feels guilty for doing that. Like it's me time and that's not supposed to happen when someone else is at home, which sounds so um, mom-like, you know? Like our me time is like the last on the list and there's a sense of guilt about it. Like we should always be waiting. Like when there's nothing else for me to do, I'll just step into this closet and you pull me out when you need me, family. Um, I have friends who's husbands have recently retired and they said it's awkward to have their husband home all the time. Sometimes the husband's stuff, you know, like watching TV all day is kind of driving them to distraction or maybe he's hovering and saying, is this what you do all day? 
how long are you on the computer? You know, especially if she's still working. Uh, so that, yeah, it's different. It's an adjustment, but it's all good, right? And when my husband's home, I feel a sense of, well, what are your plans for the day? And I will build my day around it, which I'm okay with because to some extent we both do that for each other. Um, it's not a terribly negative thing because he does the same thing. He'll ask, so what is your plans for the day? And then adjust his. So um, It's just a, an adjustment, right? Louise is struggling with all this isolation. It's been about two months of intense isolation, but what you're doing is so good. It's so important, Louise, being with family members that can't knit must be isolated. So knitting is still a therapy, you know, it's still an enjoyable thing for you. I'm so glad that you've got things to busy your mind and busy your hands and hang in there, hang in there. This time will be over before you know it. Uh, I, I did ask Louise in the comments if you have thought like, because your isolation is really intense, more so than mine. Have you had thoughts about when life goes back to normal? Is there something you want to change or make use of or, you know, something like that? Because Talitha had mentioned in my last episode, I got to take this off. <laughs> it's not winter. In my last episode, I had mentioned how <clears throat> when my kids were in high school, particularly when both were or when my... Um, They were both in high school at the same time. Right after my daughter left high school and my son went in, I, it, he, his just felt like we were busier. I actually, what I think it was, was older relatives in my family were needing more attention. So my life was busier when he was in high school. But that whole stretch of time while they were in high school, involved in things, <clears throat> it was a crazy race to get dinner on the table. And I said it was like a sprint. And Talitha was saying how it really she started thinking about how a lot of families live like this. And really, from the time the children are little, so many activities, and it's just every part of the day is scheduled, and it's not a lot of face time with each other, a quality, slow family living. And she's worried about what happens with our families when we lose that togetherness, that quality, <clears throat> slow time together. And, uh, and she wondered if, after this lockdown time, families are spending more time together. I mean, I'm seeing them every day in the park, people where there weren't people in the park, families doing things together, and they can't even just let the kids go play on the equipment because it's all roped off. They're literally out playing games with the kids. <clears throat> and uh, she was just wondering if people were going to come away from this time changed and maybe make more priority of family time. I don't know. I would like to think so. And I kind of wondered if Louise, being in such intense isol isolation, if you know you had had thoughts of something, I don't know, if you saw anything different in life. I want to just say this one thing. I don't think that crazy pace that we lived at when the kids were in high school was good. I didn't like it when it was happening. I mean, I liked for their sake that they could be, each of them had a big activity, a sport or a music thing in school that they were a part of. Both chose to be in very rigorous classes. They wanted to do it because they wanted good scholarships. And I, I couldn't tell them no. Now, if they hadn't been able to perform at the level needed for that class, if it was causing them some sort of stress, I would have said no. But they were handling it in stride it was just really busy. I look back and I think, would I change that? I don't know. And here's why. When that time was over, like when my daughter got into college, she was like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier than high school. And my son said the same thing. He's in college right now. And he's just like, oh, this is nothing compared to high school. And, uh, it hasn't been stressful for them, not really. I mean, if you wait to the last minute to study for a test, there's a level of stress, but because of the choices they made in high school, they did get scholarships. So, you know, they're not paying for school. There's no stress of having to work their way through school or work 
a while and then go to school, work a while, then go to school. They're not having to worry about that. And so it's like the, it was a trade-off in stresses. On top of that, they did get an experience playing in a band, playing a team sport that probably they won't be able to replicate very well in adult life with the other choices they've made. So to some degree, it might have been kind of once in a lifetime sort of thing. I know it's easier to learn something when you're younger, but not impossible. And is that a reason to t totally busy our lives up? I don't know. I'm sure it's individual for families, but I can say this. It's like we all had an unspoken agreement. We were like, okay, this is going to stink for a few years, but you want to do this? Are you sure? All right. If this goes too far, we're going to stop this, but if you can handle it, we're in it with you. So we would go to the events and we would work in the concession stands or whatever it took to, you know, be the parent chaperone, you know, for the events. And we all did it together. They would go to each other's thing, you know, while my daughter lived in the house, she would go to my son's things, he would go to her things some. <clears throat> but when that whole period was over, we all just were like, oh, good. <laughs> um, they have gone back to living slow lives. My daughter doesn't live with us. She has her own home, her own family. She lives a slow, easy lifestyle. None of us have become adrenaline junkies, I guess is what I'm saying. It was a planned departure from our normal way of living, kind of like you would plan to go to college for a few, certain number of years, and it might be stressful, but then you can get whatever job, you know. They made that decision, and I mean, neither of them regret it, but they both look back and say, dang, that was hard. <laughs> and the thing is, a lot of people live that way all the time, and they just continue it after high school, after their kids are, are out of it, the, the adults, the family just keeps, they're a bit addicted to the busyness. And some people are more outgoing that way. We're introverts. We're just not like that. <clears throat> so uh, it definitely gave me something to think about, Talitha, but I do believe families need slow times together. I'm sorry, my voice is going in and out. <clears throat> I'm really struggling with allergies. <clears throat> um, I'm not crying. <laughs> I'm not crying thinking about being in Friends of Soccer. Oh, I just, I just miss the concessions. Um, Anna found in this time of quarantine that she had some changes in perspective. It was a little different. She has, um, lives, eats a certain type of diet. And for her, it's a, a way of no harm, right? It's a diet. Let me see how I wrote this. Her diet is centered on doing no harm. But to get enough to eat without these foods readily available during this lockdown, she's had to compromise her standards or her um, ethics. And it's made her reconsider how to be in solidarity with other people because she was, say, vegan and didn't eat wheat and didn't eat, there's, there's probably for health reasons, but also for reasons uh, probably have to do with the meat industry um, and other things. I mean, just uh, the harm it's doing the world, certain foods we eat. And uh, she had to reconsider the cost of that because she would just get hungry. I mean, you just can't get enough calories if you can't get enough food that meets your dietary needs or desires. And I thought a lot about people with celiacs. I'm like, how are they getting wheat-free products? Um, and if you had celiacs, say, disease, and then you also were vegan, what would you do for enough nourishment? Now, where I'm living, there's plenty of options if you were vegan, but not everywhere. It's been challenging for a lot of people. And she was saying, you know, for her to say being able to get access to healthy foods that don't cause harm, that are fresh, should not be a privilege. It should be a right to every human being, but obviously it's not so. And so she's just had a lot of that on her mind as she has had to compromise her um, dietary standards to survive, you know. Um, and I'm wondering, Anna, what will this change anything? When this time is over, um, I'm sure you're not going to want to go to, you're going to want to go back to the way that you did eat, 
but what will be changed because of your experience during quarantine? I would like to hear from you. Um, so what do you think? Do you guys think that, are you changed? Is something going to be changed because of this time that you had intense family time, um, a shortage of things? What's going to be changed for you and your perspective? What are you going to take from quarantine that's going to be different from now on, even when things go back to normal? Uh, Sarah Jane took this time while she was with her family to kind of make a private sort of creative space for everyone in the family because you're all in the house together. And I don't know how big your house is, Sarah Jane, but mine is tiny. You can hear everything everyone's doing. Um, there's not you, there's a lot of togetherness. So she's been trying to kind of create craft creative spaces for each member of the family. So everybody has kind of their little place to retreat to for a bit of solitude or creative time. I love that idea. And in the process, you've been organizing and decluttering and maybe doing some decor things that you plan to do, like painting and stuff. I love that. Um, I wished I had done that. <laughs> I have not. Well, okay. No, I did one thing. I've been, I told you guys I've been working on moving my blog, which is a long process. First catching up, then backing up. But I have realized one reason I put this off is I hate sitting at my desk. I am uncomfortable. I get real wrist pain after editing photos. It's the way my desk is set up, the height of it. After reading Carson Deemer's book about knitting and um, your posture, and I'm sitting horribly right now, he wouldn't approve, but my desk height isn't correct. My um, way of handling uh, the mouse probably not so great, and I really don't like sitting so much. I sit to knit. I don't want to sit the rest of the day. And I'm just antsy sitting in front of the computer. So we figured it out. We just need a standing or adjustable sit stand desk. And we need a real desk that can be at the right height so that I don't have this broken line, you know, to my arm, the right height. And uh, plenty of space for like scanners and printers and all that stuff. So rather than buy one, <laughs> we're going to DIY one. We have some raw edged wood. Um, we were going to make shelves with it, but we don't need them. Um, we may not be living here much longer, so we're going to make a desk with it and put adjustable legs on it. So I'm really excited about that. I have no idea how we're going to make it work in our house because it's a rather large desk. And the one we've got is this little like semicircle type thing uh, coming out of the wall that my husband built to go in a corner of our bedroom. It's the tiniest thing to not take up much space, so we'll see. But what you said you were doing, Sarah Jane, made me think of that. I definitely need to figure out how to make it work in my house as a whole, though. Now, all this talk about are we stressed out, how are we doing this, how are we doing that with um, quarantine, how are we handling it, and then I hear from Katinka who has not had time to worry about, am I not accomplishing enough? Or guilt, guilty pleasures like podcasts and knitting because she has been supporting her family with knitting masks. Her business as a seamstress, I guess, has taken a total, is on the back burner because probably not a lot of people in your area of South Africa are wanting to, you know, have events and get dresses altered. Everything's shut down truly in lockdown there and her family can't do what they normally do for a living but she can make masks and ship them and so she's doing that for her own household and more and I just think you're wonderful to do that Katinka and how great that you have that option but man that is um this is a very stressful time for you I hope that even though it's very busy, there's a monotony and rhythm to it and it's not stressful. I hope so. And I wish you luck and your family luck for things kind of getting uh, somewhat back to normal for everybody soon. That's a case of someone just being grateful to have something to do right now, <laughs> you know. So we're all in different zones depending on where we live and how our government's handling it and all and how bad the virus is affecting us. 
Nixter still painting. She's using the Blue Shine Arts on Instagram's challenge to paint every day. And I love, Nick, I love your paintings that you've shown. Um, Ada has been using this time when she's not busy doing other things in lockdown to uh, naturally dye yarn. And her experiments are really beautiful. I've enjoyed seeing them. She's using a lot of natural um, plants and leaves and things around her. Like she used loquat leaves and it came up with this beautiful color. I didn't even know you could use loquat leaves. And I'm wondering, are you just guessing? Are you just grabbing leaves and saying, let's see? Or have you heard that these things will produce a color? A lot of these don't take mordant which is great because that seems like one of the things you would, um, you know, having to add stuff and all might make spontaneous natural dyeing less doable to somebody like me. So her experiments have been great and she's actually dyed some cotton linen yarn. Would like to make a summer top out of it. It's really fun to do something where you have no control over what's going to happen and it's just like being a kid and trying an experiment for the first time. You're delighted with whatever results you get because you have no expectations. I love that feeling. And I shared with you last um, episode, I don't have expectations really with crochet. I do with knitting because now I've been doing it so long. I know the correct way to do everything and I expect myself to do that. With crochet, I, I have no expectations. So, okay, let me preface this with, I am doing a three color shawl by Leslie Ann Robinson called Golden Willow. She taught a brioche, textural brioche class at um, the Knitting in the Hills retreat on the shawl. And so all of the textural brioche, she showed us how to do it and gave us like a little pamphlet with um, very exact directions like I can look at that and I, t I totally know how to do the pattern. No trouble at all. I would have struggled otherwise. So these are my colors. This is all Knit Picks yarn. This is Inverness, um, Thunderhead, and I don't know what. I think these are all Stroll yarns uh, that I'm using together. And I'm doing them just like she did her color work. The lightest one is A, the next one is B, and the darker one is C. And this is my progress so far. So I am in the second, you can see the first type of stitch. It's a honeycomb. That was single color honeycomb. This is two color honeycomb brioche. Really beautiful looking. It takes a lot of focus. But as I did it, you know, when I worked on this in her class, I was sitting next to Natalie, who is Nitty Natty on Instagram. And she had that little float tote, that tote bag, it's crocheted, and inside of it, snapped to the bo bottom of the bag, are little yarn cozies that she made, and she had her three skeins in it, and they weren't getting all nasty and tangled like mine are. So as I started working on this, I thought, I really ought to make one of those. <clears throat> she was offering a free coat at the time, and so I got the pattern. So here is the beginning of my float tote. I have this Lion Brand Re-Up yarn, which is recycled cotton in the gray and the blue. I have more blue than gray, so I am going to do a striping pattern. I kind of just, I looked at the amount of rounds that she has in the design, and then um, I uh, just kind of drew up <laughs> a stripe pattern, and I looked at you know, how many rows would I give to this and that? And so I kind of figured it out. And I may do a few extra rounds than her, depending on how deep I want it to be. But I really like how this is looking. It looks pretty profesh, doesn't it? It's really not, though, because I don't know if I'm doing this right. I feel like on hers, it's a bit of a spiraling going around and there's a line that kind of an angled line where the beginning of the round constantly changes a little. Well, I have that plus some mess here. You can see, I didn't quite understand how to do the end and beginning of rounds, how to make them look good. It's like the instructions are there, but, and then adding in striping, 
mm, it's not there's a little jog I'm okay with that totally because this is my no stress experiment and so I'm fine with it it's a very time-consuming experiment but this is two days of work that's really not bad this is big enough to hold five skeins so this is the big flip tote all right she also just came out with a pattern that's knitted so it's really um, stretchy for just yarn cozy light is what she calls it and it basically is a yarn cozy like you've seen them people use little socks and they'll stick their cake in the sock and it holds it together so that you can pull from the center of the cake which is really helpful if your cake is wound up good because like right now I've got this mess because these are coming some from the center some from the outside and then the outside and the inside are both coming off at once and it's just a mess so I also got her yarn cozy light pattern and I'm enjoying all of them so I'm going to hold a giveaway for those two patterns and let me show you what the the float tote looks like finished so you see the bag which is like a bucket bag that can be folded down or it can carry a ton of yarn and you have an insert there you can stick in and those yarn cozies snap to it so you can use three you can remove one you don't have to carry all of them if you're not doing a project that requires that many skeins and I think that's the, the, the mini float tote you get both in the pattern so you see in this top photo all those uh, cozies in there that's like five so I'm gonna have a giveaway for that pattern and the yarn cozy light both and I'm gonna do it on my Instagram so just be watching it in the next week I'm gonna host it it's not gonna be a really I don't think I'm gonna do a really long giveaway time because it's just patterns but um, I just think it'd be fun because I'm enjoying doing it and I think you guys would too and I got my pattern for free so I can buy one of you a pattern and if you've never done crochet before I totally think you can do this because my crochet experience has been super limited and we talked about summer tops you know and I asked you guys which ones are on your radar any crochet any uh, you know summer tops you've been looking at and I'll show you my progress on mine thus far this will have long sleeves but it is very much a summer top knit in Barocco remix light I've you probably can't tell I've put a couple of inches on this since last time this is um, the lacy sweater or the villanelle sweater hers is done in cotton 100% cotton this Barocco remix light is a combination of linen silk cotton and other things really nice drapey loose lightweight fabric I can't wait to have mine finished and I have it looks very similar in this color I like re, uh, remix light because of the uh, slightly tweedy look to it it's little cotton pills on it um, I don't know it just it totally feels like I'm knitting with wool I could knit with this all day and not get any aching in my hands so that has been a complete joy to work on some tops that you guys mentioned um, it was Clarice that said the Zelda crop is something on her radar this is by handmade closet and you know like this example is knit and wool but you could do this in a summer weight yarn and make it a summer weight top see even just looking at this it looks too fitted for me in summer I would feel very very warm in that even if it was summer weight yarn it's fingering yarn hers is knit and junk yarn here uh, her smooth sock base but you could use a remix light type yarn I would make it slightly oversized just because ugh, things touching my body in the summer <laughs> I want to feel like I can move and not be too sweaty uh, but you could use a cotton yarn like Lindy chain or something and and it would be a very summer weight Regina intends to knit another love note sweater Regina's love note was so beautiful really inspiring um, she's wanting to make a summer weight version so maybe in cotton or linen or a combination of both I think that would be a great idea um, I feel like that shape of sweater would work really well with something like the 
Remix Light or Lindy Chain, really you just couldn't go wrong with anything. And linen gives a texture to a knit, good drape and texture. That would be really nice with a little ease so that it's not tight and hot and sweaty. Very nice. Now Ivana of Republic of Me um, has been crocheting, but it's not a summer top. It is a blanket of her hand spun and it's really beautiful. Um, she had photos online on her Instagram that you should look at. And Ivana has a new podcast called Republic of Me. She has one episode out and I really enjoyed watching it. She makes more than just knitting. She does knitting and crochet, but she talks about painting and gardening and other things. And she has really soothing, just warm, gentle video that she shows. I really like how she does that. I feel like um, Ivana's videos were so well filmed, like she's using a real camera to make her videos rather than my quick phone videos I do. I really like the effort and the quality that she put into her editing of her video. And I like the things that she had to show that she's making. I really enjoy seeing knitters and crocheters, the other parts of their life, obviously, because that's what I talk about here. So that was really beautifully done. I, um, I was really inspired, and so I made some, I shot some beautiful video too. Cupping the wind! <laughs> okay, so summer tops. So I talked about this last week, Into the Wild. I want to knit this. I have some, it's a DK weight yarn from Lion Brand, held double. I have some, it's Kobu, I think. I have some <clears throat> Billow from Knit Picks, which is bulky, but to me it's more ran. It might work. It's going to be kind of heavy, though. I also have some Pima Cotton <clears throat> from Cloudborn in a green color that might work. So um, that that may be happening. I, I'm not, I don't want to use my super bright green for it. I want to use that for something else, maybe the sweet pea top. Pom Pom has come out with some, or is about to come out with, some really great designs. I don't know if you've seen the, the teasers on Instagram. Oh, I see a bag of color work that looks so good, and a color work top that looks like it's knit in cotton. Looks a little fitted, but a, a really interesting design. Maybe mosaic knitting. I am so excited to get this issue, and I hope... The stash I have works with something in there because I know I just got to start knitting from my pom-poms. I have them. <coughs> I love every issue and yet I haven't knit but maybe one thing, maybe two things. Now that's wasteful. That's stupid. I want to make Argle. It's a tie front stripe top. It's got a lot of ease to it. It looks very cool. For summer and I want to do it in knit Lindy chain. Another thing is Emily Green's Ginkgo Fight. And maybe Kotlin. I would really, really like making that and in a similar color. And I have some Kotlin that I think would work for it. And I talked about it. I talked about it when it came out. I wanted to do it. One other designer with a lot of great summer designs, it's Dondo, is the name of her brand, but Yumiko Alexander. Let me just show you Harmony. This is a crochet top, so it's got lace, but it's so interesting. It's so different than anything else I've seen. I want to make this so much. It's lace and it calls for sport weight. Elemental Dolman. So it's a dolman sweater and kind of a classic shape, but look right down the sleeve. And you can see this whole thing is a very breezy, airy fabric. That would be really nice. I feel like this would be a good one when you're really worried about gauge. Because there is a lot of ease with this, if your gauge was a little off, it wouldn't be the end of the world maybe. I really like that pattern. So those are some fun summer tops I wanted to show you guys. So Catherine commented, I was talking about, um, 
I don't know, I made some mention of stuff I've been trying to do and then thinking, well, you know, I've spent so much time doing other things, basically being a stay-at-home mom and being a um, <clears throat> caregiver and stuff, to an extent a caregiver, uh, that when time came to do it again, like something with my blog, I just felt like maybe that ship has sailed and I felt kind of weird about it. And she made a comment that, you know, after doing something intensive for years, like raising children or something, a person should give themselves some weeks, months, maybe a year to kind of readjust and see where they are now, where their interests are, who they are now. Do they even want to do the things they once thought they wanted to do? And it's just time to rediscover who you are after nurturing people for so long. And that is exactly how I felt like two years ago my time caregiving or whatever ended after that time of being very much present for family members passed uh, about three years ago it was a year or two to rebuild my health because it had suffered then this last year or so I have been focusing on my confidence level I just finally had space and time to really look at it. It should be high after giving so much and in doing so much. It should be higher, but it's not. I just felt like a lot of time has passed since I just say something like my blog. Well, it used to be good. I used to enjoy doing it, but now, you know, that's too, too, that time has passed. Everybody's doing that. Everybody's doing this. Everybody, you know, nobody cares. I'm not really, I don't have any real skills for anything anymore. I learned a little of this. I learned a little of that. And I don't know anything very well. Not. I think that's common of a lot of women. And sometimes, I don't know. I, I wonder what you think about it. I think that you're right, Catherine. I needed more than a year after that time of caring for people. I probably wouldn't have felt that way if it had just been raising children, but because of the raising children while taking care of people at the end of their life thing was in combination, it was extra extreme, <laughs> very emotional. And uh, yeah, my confidence was just low. What am I capable of doing now? You know, I didn't, I didn't ever learn how to do this properly or that, you know, I know a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but not a lot of anything, any one thing. And uh, just creatively, the ways I would express myself, I just wasn't as sure about now. So I really retreated within myself quite a bit in the last few years. And this podcast was some of coming out, but then I get a lot of views on an episode and I find I am just really nervous about that. <laughs> I don't know if I like it, you know, like, why are they looking at me? I'm, I'm sitting in front of a camera. I want to be seen, but I don't want to be seen. And uh, like that sweater episode where I tried on every sweater I ever did. I liked that episode. I would love watching someone do that. But it got so many views that it weirded me out. And I felt kind of like hiding. It's like when I think about talking to you guys, I am picturing those of you who talk back and those I know watch. And I don't have a confidence crisis right before I call a friend, right? That's how I view this. But then all of a sudden, if I knew it was a party line and there was a lot of people listening, I might feel kind of weird. That's what I'm on the internet for. That's what YouTube is for. It's really silly. And so I just had to look at what is this about me? What is this um, issue? And if someone is rude to me, my confidence can be so shaken for days. I got to get over this. So... Um, I've spent a lot of time in the last year looking at boundaries, seeing where I should have made boundaries before, for instance, Talitha, in my time. Confidence. Something I heard recently was um, about imposter syndrome. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I've heard designers and makers talk about it. Um, I listened to an interview where someone talked about it. Um, and... I had never heard that phrase until, I don't know, the last year. But it's basically when you feel like 
whatever good things have come to you, whatever success that you've had, it's just a freak accident. And any minute now, you're going to botch it up, prove that that was just an accident. It wasn't because of your hard work or your ability, and everybody's going to see that you're a fraud. <clears throat> I don't know if that quite describes how I feel, but maybe I just assume it and I feel nervous if people are watching. <laughs> I I'm not sure. But it is something that seems to be more predominant with women, which is interesting, and it might have to do with discrimination. I would imagine, they say anytime you're in a situation where people would assume a woman would do worse, you're obviously going to be, if you're in that environment regularly, say at a job, you would be more likely to have imposter syndrome. So I'm wondering, what about if you're a minority and a woman? Would it be even worse, possibly? Is Are the numbers even higher with people of color? I don't know. I haven't looked that up. But I just looked up, like, 70% of people, and it's men and women, have experienced this. And it kind of, the term was coined in the late 70s, I think. And here's what they say. Some of the um, common feelings they have. A sense of perfectionism. Like, if I'm going to do something, it has to be done absolutely perfectly, or they'll question their competence. I used to be a very perfectionist. I'm not now, but I could see that. Expert. Feeling like you have to be an expert at something. Um, you don't even want to try if you can't understand all the facets and do it like an expert. That I can see a little of in myself. Like, I will feel like, okay, okay, okay. If I'm going to do this, I need to figure out how to do it all. You know, like, for instance, I'm learning new software for photo editing. And I still haven't fully made use of my new camera since getting a, um, um, a full sensor camera. I'm still not as comfortable with it as I once was with a smaller sensor. So, you know, I, I kind of feel like, well, okay, I don't want to do this until I've learned all the things I can learn about this new Lightroom uh, Creative Cloud. Right? So, I, I see that. And then some people, they say if you're a natural genius, which I'm not a genius, but if you're naturally good at certain things, that when you do bump up against something that takes a little effort, you immediately assume, oh, I'm just not good at this, and so you quit trying. Sometimes there's soloist people who um, feel like they have to do it on their own. They don't want to ask for help. Sometimes I'm that way. And then there's supermen or superwomen, people who push themselves. To prove that they're worthy, they must take on a lot more stress in accomplishing than is normal. That makes me think of people who feel they have to accomplish lots of new tasks on lockdown. Anyway, you know, they talk about why, in this article I'm reading, why you, um, and I'll link it, it's not the authority on the subject, but why you would feel this way, and some of it's personality and maybe genetics, but also your parents, your um, environment that you're in all the time. And uh, the main difference, they say, between somebody who has this syndrome and someone who doesn't is how you respond to your thoughts. Do you just go ahead and work through and get it done, or do you halt and stop and get paralyzed? And so kind of, I, I just read this today, but what I decided a few weeks ago, well, I feel nervous and weird about putting myself out there in this way again. Even if I kind of did it at one time, I feel weird now. I just decided to just do it anyway. It's such a nothing thing. I mean, you guys are probably thinking, what is she talking about? It's nothing. It's all here. So for me, I just had to decide what am, okay. When I have a thought, and it really often happens after somebody slights me or is rude to me, and sadly, depending on certain family members you may have, relatives, you might hear more of that. And there are some people you can cut off contact with, there's some you can't. So I would often feel crushed and paralyzed. Oh, you don't do anything right. You can't do anything right. Hearing that kind of thing in my head, um, I've, I've learned over the years to sit take these thoughts I'm having and to pull them out and really look at them objectively is this a normal thought for someone to have would this be fair for 
would I let anyone else around me have this thought? No, then it's not balanced. And I just compare it with reality and my reality. And it's shifted how I see myself over the years. <clears throat> I've talked to you about this some. But uh, another thing is just forcing myself to do something and just a little bit of a task every day towards something that kind of makes me nervous or challenges me. Maybe you guys can relate. So talk to me about it. Have you ever experienced this imposter syndrome? I keep doing quotes. Maybe this is why I feel insecure being online. Maybe. Um, do you ever have this imposter syndrome or something like it? I'm going to have a link to some fun videos. Hopefully I'll find them all again. My kids send me funny things um, that make me smile during the week. And maybe you could use a smile, so... That will be in the notes, possibly at the bottom. YouTube makes me cut my notes short. So if you want the full notes, go to the blog or go to the Ravelry episode thread. But I put the pertinent things in the YouTube description box also. Okay, so my questions for you. How are you, uh, have you ever had an imposter syndrome? Have you ever experienced that? Um, or just low confidence in general, and what do you do about it? What are you doing about it? Maybe you're not doing anything and you want to, but what do you do about it? And if you're like a creative type, if at your job or with what you do with your time, you've experienced it, how have you gotten over it? Or how are you getting over it? Um, I'll word it better in the YouTube description. Also, have any of you been thinking about how you want to do something differently given things you are experiencing in quarantine. I'd be interested to hear. So please share those things with me and also everything you're making, everything you're knitting, please talk about it. We have a whips and FO thread on the Ravelry group. I'm there. I'm present now. Please show me what you're doing. I'm going to go post these things in the whips and FO thread. Wait, 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 wait.